Throughout this hack series, we've been talking about ways that God will inspire you. Maybe not even with personal application inside of the service, just starting the conversation with a bunch of things. And so this morning's uh, message, same thing. I don't know how God is going to inspire you to respond to today's message. I don't know what the application is going to be for you. I know that it'll probably be different than the person to your left or to your right, but I want you to trust that God is going to do more with that application than you even think. You may think that it's for this and to make this impact, and here's God's, how God's going to use it, and he is actually orchestrating eternities to be affected, maybe even with you leaning in in a different way than you have before. We look at the different weeks of the series. The first week we had uh, the factory reset. Talking about what does it look like to get to the, the original operating system of us surrendering our lives to Christ. What is the purity of our life and how that is reflected in Jesus' forgiveness that he gives us because of his death and raising from the dead? And if you weren't here for that message, I would encourage you, go back and listen to that message. It's so vitally important. It's what everything is based off of. Second week, we looked at now implementing a healthy rhythm of reading scripture for ourselves, how God wants to communicate to you through this Holy Spirit-inspired text that is not just relevant for 2,000-some years ago, uh, that is alive and active, that is speaking to you right now, that he wants to use that word to guide and direct and instruct and encourage you in every day. Last week, we talked about mental health and mental illness and about what it looks like to re- program our neural pathways and our habits to align ourselves more with the truth of what God says than the ways of this world. Now, here's the problem. Not the problem, but the human tendency. The human tendency is with these first three things for it to feel like these are very me-focused. If you've ever heard oxygen mask principle, um, the oxygen mask principle says, just like the oxygen masks in the plane, hey, when they fall, put on your oxygen mask first and then assist the kid next to you, right? But make sure that you're healthy first or you can't adequately help the person next to you. And so the first three messages, if we're not careful, they begin to feel oxygen mask principle and we can begin to fool ourselves by thinking we can be healthy by ourselves and once we are healthy by ourselves then we lean into the lives of other people if you're not healthy get back by yourself eliminate the variable the imperfection of other people make sure that you're good and then lean back out into um, relationship again but here's the myth the myth is that we cannot be healthy by ourselves. Oh, I wrote we can. That should be cannot. We cannot be healthy by ourselves. Carrot not. Let's see if you guys are paying attention. We cannot be healthy by ourselves. You cannot be healthy by yourself. You cannot lock yourself in a padded room and have a healthy relationship with God. You cannot spiritually grow, be spiritually mature, spiritually grow by yourself. It is an impossibility. So if you're thinking that you can just vacate, leave the variable of everybody else, make yourself healthy, and then show up for somebody else, it is an impossibility. Uh, have you guys ever heard of dashboard items? We've talked about this in here before, but apparently nobody's here that day. Dashboard items, here's the concept. If you look in a plane, uh, you, if you look in the cockpit of a plane, you'll see all these different indicators and gauges and levers and buttons. And uh, if you watch the pilot when he's flying, the pilot's not doing this the whole time, right? Like just constantly looking at all these buttons. The, he has just a few gauges, a few dashboard gauges that he's watching. And if those are in the green, then he knows that things are good. If one of those is in the red, then he begins his check down. And he knows if this is in the red, then I need to start this flow chart. I need to make sure because maybe this is wrong. If that's good, then maybe this is wrong. And he starts to determine why that thing is in the red. We as humans have dashboard items. We have things that we should have, be monitoring all the time to decide, okay, if this is green, then that's good. But I also know if this thing is in the red, then I begin my check down to determine why this thing is in the red. So I, a big one I think is anger. 
is anger. If there's a dashboard item of anger and all of a sudden that goes off, that's in the red, the answer isn't just you're an angry person. Then you start the check down and chances are that there is pride. Chances are that there's insecurity. Chances are that there's envy. Chances are that there is resentment or unforgiveness or bitterness. And you begin to check these lights to determine why this thing is in the red. Um, what's another? Another one is, let's say gossip, right? Let's say gossip, that, that you just find that your life is kind of consumed with talking about other people. Usually what gossip is, is trying to determine where you are on the social ladder, how good you are compared to other people. And you gossip to either make yourself feel better or to tear somebody else down so that they're below you. And you begin to check that indication light. And same things, pride, insecurity, resentment, Bitterness, you begin to see what are the lights or what, what are the indicators that are making this thing in the red. So one of the huge dashboard items and what we're going to talk about this morning, I believe, is relationships. I think that relationships is a massive dashboard item for us. That's something that we need to continually monitor is this gauge, this red or green button that we would, that we would say, do I have healthy relationships in my life? So what we're, the goal is by the end of today's service, again, application will be everywhere, but the goal is by the end of today's service, we're going to dig down enough so that in the future, if your relationship light is in the red, that you know what those indicators are, that you know what the things are that are leading to relationships being a green or a red in your life and, you know, dig deep enough um, for you to determine even why relationships exist. Do we need relationships? If they're a dashboard item, then we're saying it's important enough to be there. And if it's in the red, it's not a, you know, check engine light that you put tape over and go, eh, whatever, who cares? That they're important enough that you need those. So relationships viewed in a bunch of different ways. Men and women both, I think, have been raised kind of by society to view relationships differently. Men, again, this is generalizing. But I think that men have been kind of raised to think that relationships are good the way that hobbies are good. Like, it's good to have. It adds flavor to life. But I don't know that we're raised to, to think that relationships are necessary. In fact, uh, I, would, I would challenge that society tells men a lot of the times that the goal is to get to a place where you're independent. It is to get to a place where you don't have to work for somebody else, where you don't have to rely on somebody else, when you're self-sufficient. And it's not always bad. Like, uh, that's what you're trying to raise your kids to, to be and to know, right? Like, at some point you go, you can't live here forever, right? I hope, fingers crossed. And you got to... At some point, you've got to move out of mom and dad's house. At some point, you've got to be independent. But the problem is, is that we never graduate beyond that. And so this pressure that people feel in the adolescence to be independent, to be self-sufficient, self, or um, to not rely on other people, that carries over. And then you get to the point where we talk relationships and you go, ah, that's a weakness. That's for people who couldn't cut it. That's for people who could never get to a place where they're strong enough not to rely on somebody else. Now, women, it feels like it's a little bit different. Usually women don't need to be convinced that they need relationship, usually. Usually uh, what women struggle with is finding the right relationships. They, they usually think, I can't find good relationships. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's me. I don't know if it's other people. I don't know if it's just the women that I'm around. But whether you've been betrayed by relationships before or you're just not sure what to expect out of relationships, it feels like the second you get into friendships that you go, man, this just does not feel like it's checking the box. This does not feel like a fulfilling thing. And you're thinking to yourself, am I expecting too much or am I just finding the wrong people? What does it look like for me to begin these around me? And so as far as hacked goes, men are hacked to think you don't need community. And a lot of times women are hacked to think that I can't find good community. 
And that is a hack. That is the enemy that is lying to you to keep you away from something that is vital in your existence. That is the enemy that is trying to give you a lie so that you will remain isolated and you will not be around what God has desired for you inside of relationships. Um, I wrote very simply, God actually, here's his purpose for relationship. God will use the vehicle of relationships in your life to be the primary way that he pours out his grace into your life. He will use relationships in your life, listen, as the primary vehicle that he pours out grace into your life. And, and that is how you grow spiritually. And that is wild. Think about that. Think about taking you or me, a messy, screwed up individual, putting them with other messed up, screwed up individuals, and somehow in the collection of messy, screwed up individuals, all parties thrive and actually spiritually grow in spite the fact that it is a bunch of imperfection and mess. But God has designed that. That is his primary vehicle that he pours out his grace in your life. It's the primary vehicle that he uses to spiritually grow you. Now, the vehicles that God uses, this is going to bum everybody out, but the relationships that he'll bring into your life will often be with people who are not like you and people you don't necessarily like. So look around the room, find someone that you don't like and point to them right now. God is going to use that person. It does seem counterintuitive though, doesn't it? It does seem counterintuitive. Think back in your life when somebody, that person that you just were, would never ever expect to make an impact in your life was used by God. Think back in your life with a person that if it was up to you, you would have avoided with everything in you. Somehow God used that person to breathe even life, to challenge something that you wouldn't have heard if it wasn't for that person. Me personally, the reason it's counterintuitive is because I think if relationships are here to build me up, if relationships are to build me up, I know what builds me up and I know what doesn't build me up. If I get on an airplane and the person next to me talks to me, I know within three sentences if this is a convo plane ride or a headphone plane ride, all right? <laughs> Like, I go, I, I know myself. I know who this type of person is. This is not what builds me up. Um, and that kind of brings up a problem at the root of relationships when it comes to human tendency. It's something that has been there in the entire series, and the problem is this, is that we as humans are innately self-focused. We as humans are innately self-serving. If you look at those dashboard items, look at anger. Look at, look at rage. Look at the self-focus of rage. What does rage do? What does anger do? Essentially, it manipulates the room. It manipulates the people around you. It manipulates conversations so that everybody is pandering to you so that things are as comfortable as possible for you. Anger makes everything self-focused. How does this benefit me? Look at, look at lust. Look at pornography. It becomes everything about what is good for me. There's a word called satiety that means just instant gratification, right? And so we start to live our lives as a transcendent experience, satiety. How are we satisfied? How, how, does it, how does this feel good for me? How can I control things to cater to me? And the problem is, is if all of a sudden anger is mental satiety because I can control the way that I feel in my mind, I can control the conversations that are had around me, I can control the way that I think, the way that people respond to me. If lust all of, all of a sudden becomes physical satiety, I can control this area of my life and how I feel, then that doesn't stay relegated to those areas. It transcends and then relationships become emotional satiety. Relationships are now about what other people can do for me. 
And if everything that we do is, is me focused, is about what, what, what my relationship with you can do for me, then I'm trying to judge based on my feelings, based on my temporary understanding what is best for me, and I begin to manipulate people the same way with relationships as I do with anger, same way that I do with physical satiety, with lust. Um, as we've been going through this uh, this series, there's something that's kind of stood out to me as I, as I look back on the weeks. And what stood out was everything that we're talking about, if it is the healthy version of what we're talking about, is a gift from God and not something that we have earned. It has not been self-focused. Now, has, is it good for us? Yes. But it's good for us because we are connected with our life source, with God. Not because it is about how good we feel. Let's look at the first thing, salvation, that Pastor Eric talked about. Salvation. The factory reset of forgiveness because what Jesus has done. That is a gift from God. It is not something that we earn. In fact, it says that, that this is a gift from God. Forgiveness is a gift of God, not of your works, not of anything that we could do so that we can't brag that we earned it ourselves. Instead, it is an open-handed gift that we just recognize is completely given. I have done nothing to deserve this. The second week, a gift from God, the truth of scripture breathed into the Bible that we are given to correct us, to guide us. That is a gift that we have been given. The Holy Spirit continues to use it to breathe inspiration into you as you live. It's given to you. Even last week, when we start talking about mental illness and aligning our thought patterns with what God desires for us, man, that is not something that we can achieve. That is not something that we go after. That is a gift from us. Now, there are things that we can do to get ourselves out of the way. There are things that we can do to open up our receptors there are recognitions of roadblocks that we have put in there that we can say, all right, I don't want that to be a roadblock anymore. I want to completely receive. But as far as the truth and the fulfillment and the joy of what we've been given, that is a gift. That is not something that we can earn. So I want to encourage you. When we talk about fulfillment, when we talk about joy, even in relationships, that joy is received, not achieved. Joy is received, not achieved. That through this, the hacked idea, sometimes the enemy will lie to you and say that you can do these certain things and you can achieve something supernatural or spiritual when the only way that we can receive something supernatural or spiritual is beyond the natural, beyond our control. Now, just because I've said that joy is received, not achieved, then we start to think, well, if it's not achieved, it's received, then I can just sit in my recliner, right, day after day and just say, joy, bring it on, right? Let me just make some store-bought cinnamon rolls, and I don't know why they have to be store-bought. I guess they could be homemade. I like store-bought. And then, God, bring on your joy. I'm just going to sit here. I'm going to receive what you have for me. And I don't want us to be disillusioned this morning to think that just because something is received, it means that it won't take effort on our part. It will still take effort on our part. If we're going to remove the barriers between us and receiving purely what God has for us, it takes effort. It takes journey. And so even through relationships, what I'm not talking about is us achieving joy. I'm talking about us receiving. But when I say that, what I mean is that you are not the source of your joy. You don't provide your own joy. You don't provide your own fulfillment. You can't ever achieve something because you cannot create it. And so when we talk about joy in relationships, I want to encourage you that you, other people are not the source of your joy. Even though God has created you for a relationship, it's the primary vehicle that he pours out his grace upon you. Other people are not dictating your joy. Other people align you with what you've been designed to thrive in. Other people in relationships with other people will open up a side of you that needs to be open to receive the joy that your life source is giving you. But our, our, our joy comes from God. So we're going to look at this together this morning is why relationships? Why relationships? Does this matter that much? Like, like how much stock is God putting in in relationships in our life? And the first reason is we were designed for relationships. We were designed for relationships. 
When we are not connected to other people, then we start to think, okay, I'm not connected to other people because of self-protection. When actually, when we're not connected to other people, things go south very quickly. Watch this video. Wi-Fi is a magical thing. It lets you connect to the internet, stream your favorite shows, video chat with friends, and scroll through social media, all without a single cable. But like all magic, it comes with a few catches. You need to protect your Wi-Fi router with your own password. Otherwise, other parties can log on and slow down your vital connection speeds. Even worse, an unprotected Wi-Fi is vulnerable to hackers who can access your devices and change or damage your router settings. This can lead to a Wi-Fi blackout. While a strong Wi-Fi signal keeps you happily connected, a weak or unstable connection can turn your day upside down. Imagine you're watching your favorite show and suddenly the video buffers. <laughs> Annoying, right? That's what happens when your Wi-Fi connection isn't strong or consistent. Poor connectivity can be caused by various things. Too many devices using the same network, physical obstacles like walls, or interference from other electronic devices. And when your connection slows down or drops entirely, frustration kicks in. Before you know it, you've entered the wireless wasteland, and the fight for your life begins. <laughs> when social dynamics break down and you lose your connection to the real, who knows what could happen? I'm not sure if it'd go to that, uh, to that length at all. But here's, here's the thing is that, you know, I used this quote last week that C.S. Lewis said, both good and evil increase at compound interest. And one of the enemy's lies is that, hey, you can get to a place where you just plateau. And that's not true. If, if isolation starts to take over, then everything in your life becomes convincing yourself that you don't need relationships and adversely. If they become something that is thriving in your life, that God will use it to grow you towards him to spiritually mature you. We were designed for relationships. You know, a lot of us have kind of learned how to use things outside of their original design. Uh, one of the things that I love to do, I like edging yards. I don't know why that's my thing. I just like to edge yards. I like to be outside. I like the way it looks after edging. That's just my thing. So uh, one time I was edging the, the lawn for somebody, uh, one of my friends, and I get the whole thing done except for the very last strip. And when it gets to the very last strip, I run out of gas. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. And so in my mind, I was like, should I go fill up with gas? No. Instead, I'm going to use this edger like a <laughs> curling broom, essentially. And with about 30 minutes of the hardest work I've ever done, I got done, looked back at my work, and it looked terrible. And I think I'm still sore, and that was two years ago. And I just thought to myself, okay, what we do in life is we use things without their power, right? That's what I was doing. I was using the, the, the edger without its power. And instead of adding power, what we tend to do in our lives is we become really, really good at using the curling broom. And instead of being good in relationships, asking the right questions about what power looks like in relationships, what God desires in relationships, we've just been really, really good at managing in isolation. And so maybe this morning is just simply a confession or a God, what does it look like to introduce this thing that I've been hurt in before instead of just managing in isolation, instead of being people who are just really good at curling broom, why don't we add power to the thing that God has designed us for? We are designed for relationship. Now, um, Genesis 1, 26, here's how we know. It says, then God said... God said, let us, 
So notice the plural there, right? So it's like a conversation that's happening. There's a term called the Godhead. So God exists as three distinct persons. Uh, This is beautiful and a mystery, right? We try to explain it a million different ways here on earth. Uh, The integration of the three, one day we'll have perfect clarity. Right now it is just something that is beautiful that we can marvel at. But what we do know is that God in his essence, in his being, exists in relationship. If you've heard that term Godhead or the Trinity, you have God the Father, you have God the Son, you have God the Holy Spirit. They exist as one person. And so when God was creating man, he said, let us create man in our likeness, meaning very simply there's this conversation in perfect harmony that was had in the Godhead that said, we're going to make man, create man to need relationship with the core of his being the same way that we exist in relationship with the core of God and the core of his existence. So God created us not only for the need of relationship, but think about this. Think about the first uh, two humans. He took the likeness, the sameness of humanity, and he divided them into two distinct genders. And then he designed the world, he designed life that we would be interdependent on each other to propel the human race forward. Everything in us is created as a need, as a desire for relationship. Now, um, that's one. Why relationships? One is we are designed for relationships. Here's another one. Number two is zapping is not God's plan A. Zapping is not God's plan A. Let me explain a little bit. So we say, I'm lonely. I'm in a lot of pain, God. Would you ease this pain? Would you ease this loneliness? And part of us is hoping that God will go, I got you, zap, you're no longer lonely, right? Or I have this mind-numbing, continual sin to screw up this thing that I can't shake in my life. I need to be rid of it, God. Please take it out of my life. And that God will go, zap, you no longer deal with that. Congratulations. No more pride, zap, right? No, no more addiction, zap. And uh, the reality is that God does not zap us into spiritual maturity. God does not zap you into growing spiritually. God's desire from the beginning was not to zap, but instead was to use imperfect relationships around you to spiritually grow you in the areas that you are pleading God to help in. That he is sending help, and actually he is a good God for not zapping that we'll look at today. Okay, Ephesians 4, 15 through 16. How do we know this? So this is talking to the church, right? This is talking to the gathered group of believers. Uh, He says, verse 15, speaking the truth in love, we grow to be the mature body of him, the head that is Christ. So we have Christ as the head and recognizing Christ as the head, right? We are the body. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So, how do we grow? How do we grow as Christians? We have Jesus Christ as the head of the body, and he knows the blueprint for your growth. When you talk about a five-year plan or a 10-year plan or a 20-year plan, and how many times have we done a five-year plan or a 10-year plan, and three months down the road, we go, well, scrap that whole thing, COVID, right? How many times that have God has the blueprint for your growth? A five, 10, 15, 20 eternity growth plan And he is going to use other people in your lives, these architects, these workers called other people, and they're going to use their gifts the unique way that they have been created to speak into your life. So in the absence of other people, you are not going to experience God's plan A for growth. And if that's the case, then I wrote this. If I'm going to lay aside what holds me back, sin, selfishness, pride, lack of understanding, blind spots, fears, inadequacies, if I'm going to ultimately surrender that to the way that God would have me grow in those areas, I am now inviting a scary but necessary component of relationships into my life. Here's how he does that. First Peter 4.10 
Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. So everybody in here has been given a gift. Everybody in here has been given something special. You are not like anybody else in this room, and that is on purpose. You are designed and orchestrated to come here because you offer something. When we talk about rooted, the first thing that we say in rooted is that when you got that little inspiration in your spirit to sign up for something, though it was terrifying, that was God who was laying that on your spirit. And the reason that he was is because right now he is orchestrating the groups, orchestrating relationships, not only for something that you need in this season, but because you are going to play a vital role in the life of somebody else. You have a gift that somebody else needs. This church has a gift, or this church has a need for your gift. And if he's bringing you here, he wants to affirm that gift in you and say, I'm bringing you here for a reason. Don't sit on the sidelines. We need that as a part of the church, as the body of believers lean into that. First Peter 4.11 If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. So when you're speaking into somebody's life, God can use humans to speak his words. I don't know if anybody has ever experienced that over in the prayer corner. Have you ever been in a moment where you just go, God, I need to receive your grace. God, right now I just need to receive some healing. God, I just need to receive your love. And it probably wasn't a zap. At that moment, somebody leaned in, even though it was uncomfortable, and affirmed who you were. At that moment, somebody leaned in and said, remember that this is who God is and what he thinks about you. It's through relationships. It continues and says, if anybody serves, they should do so with the strength God provides. That's why we say to be a part of this church is to use our gifts in the various ways this church comes together. That's why we want every single person in here to sign up to serve because we are a collection of gifts that God has brought together. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. All right. So the next question is why then? Why use people? Why not just zap us? That seems a lot easier, doesn't it? Like if God just all of a sudden lightning just came down, all of a sudden we're all fixed. God, like do that. Here's why. God chooses to use other people. There are two things that I get as the receiver. One is I get the actual, what God is speaking to you to say into my life. I get the encouragement. I get the guidance. I get God's word actually through you. But the other thing that I get to do as the receiver is I get to exercise the muscle of humility. I get to exercise the muscle of humility. You know, I have always said up here that I'm a proponent of calling out blind spots. And for somebody who says that, I'm pretty defensive about mine. Um, I feel like I have narrowed down so many times the people I will let speak into my life. I think it's pride. I think it's insecurity. I, 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 don't know, I don't know what it is, but almost like that plane ride. Like I instantly just think, is this, person, is this person worthy to speak into my life? How disgusting is that? And I narrow it down to people who are smarter than I am. I narrow it down to people who are wiser than I am, who have more Bible knowledge, who are older. And I've reduced down this voice into what I think is worthy to speak into my life. God is very, very clear. 1 Peter 5, 5. God opposes the proud. But he gives grace. If I'm proud, I don't need anything. Man, how many of us are just in here with this shield of pride that God is wanting to tear down? God is just wanting to factory reset in that and just say, would you be willing to receive from me from that person that you never thought could speak in your life because they are opposite you in every single thing? That we would lay down our pride. You know, another benefit of this is the person who is bringing you the grace. The person who is bringing you the grace when they know that they are actually used by God. Um, we're out of time, but shortly I'll share this story. Kind of a, one of the hardest days of my life, um, my dad, uh, his third divorce, uh, I found out an hour before my birthday party, which was a tough one. I, I don't know why that hit me in a certain way, but um, 
So I was about to have a birthday party in about two hours and a buddy of mine showed up an hour early, uh, not invited an hour early, but he showed up an hour early. And I had just heard the news and, uh, and, he sh- whew, and he showed up. And for whatever reason, I became so angry at him. And I began to scream at him. And I told him to get out. And I told him I wanted to be alone. And I told him I didn't need him. And I said, listen, and he goes, I'm gonna be here. I go, I'm telling you, that's not what I need. Like, I need you out of this room, get out of this room. And he went over to the couch and he sat down. He said, I'm not leaving. And I sat there and I yelled at him for about 20 minutes while he was sitting there on the couch. And then finally I broke and I went over and sat next to him and put my head on his shoulder. And I didn't say thank you right then, uh, but maybe two years later, I said, hey dude, I don't know if I've ever told you this, but uh, you borderline saved my life that day. And uh, he goes, you know, I felt like God told me to come over an hour early. And I just go, I just wanted to tell you and affirm you that God absolutely spoke to you. Sometimes you don't know what God is going to do just with your willingness to step into something that's uncomfortable. With your willingness to step in an area that you've been hurt in a thousand times before. That doesn't feel like it's worth it. But we get to move beyond emotional satiety. We get to move beyond what does this do for me? We begin to start to think bigger. Start to think beyond ourselves. Start to think what does God want to do with me and my unique gifts and my passions and my ability to step into the uncomfortable? How is these shifting eternities through the relationships around me? From a conversation I had last week, I was reminded of a prayer that we had said maybe a few years ago that I wanted to bring back up. This is a prayer that we can start every morning with. So would you read this with me? God, I'm in desperate need of help today. In your grace, send your helpers to me today. Give me the courage to be honest and give me the humility to receive the help when it comes. Father, we are open-handed in the way that you would that you would work. And we realize that though this was a life-saving moment for me in relationships, that we're talking joy as well. That we cannot have joy outside of relationship. We cannot, joy is not something that we just receive from you and then people drain us of that joy and then we get recharged. That you are using other people as vehicles of joy and fulfillment in our life because other people align us with you and what you desire to do. We are humble enough to receive it if you put it in our lives. We love you and we are learning to trust you more and more every day. In your precious name, amen.